the last 10 years or so, uh, I've been working as a, as a reporter and a writer looking at um, what some describe as illicit networks, um, essentially looking at the ways in which things move illicitly around the planet, whether it's drugs or trafficked people or smuggled people or laundered money or guns, what have you. The, the drugs and thugs beat, as we sometimes call it. Um, and it's, it's an interesting field, but one that's very, very difficult to research because it, it sort of stubbornly resists empirical inquiry. It's by its nature, uh, off the books, under the table. It's, it's hard to gather real reliable data uh, in, in this area. And you really get kind of a cleavage where what you can find is, is anecdotal information on the one hand, stories of individual people and experiences that you can tell hopefully in a, in a vivid way. Um, but then at a broader level, you get really a lot of junk statistics, basically big numbers that are thrown around, largely based on back of the envelope calculations uh, that really aren't all that reliable. I can give you a bunch of examples, but just to give you one, if you, you want to try and figure out the scale of the drug trade in the United States, there are different numbers that you'll see about the, the uh, revenue that the drug cartels make from all of the drugs that they bring into the U.S. So the Department of Justice has a figure that's used over the years which is that the, the combined revenue of the Mexican and Colombian cartels is about 18 to 39 billion dollars. Now if you think about that range right there, that should probably give you a little bit of pause. Uh, and then in addition, you get RAM, uh, which has done its own number crunching and says that in fact the combined revenue is closer to 6 billion. So to some extent, these numbers um, become almost meaningless. They're so broad in, in, in the range. So I was really excited a couple of years ago to learn that Justin and his colleagues at Google Ideas have picked this problem set as one that they want to look at. Uh, and I was intrigued as well, because if you think about it, there's a, there's a, a certain ambition, if not hubris, in the idea that you're going to take a, a data-driven approach to a field which, almost by definition, uh, is one in which data itself is elusive. And I'm hoping that Justin can tell us a little bit about uh, how you guys came to do that and the type of work you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. It's great to be here. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with Google Ideas, uh, we use technology to enable people to confront threats in the face of conflict, instability, or oppression. Uh, looking at Listen Networks specifically, I've had the privilege the last couple of years to work with Polaris Project down in DC. Actually, do folks know Polaris? Let's just do a quick show, show of hands. How many have heard of Polaris? So very few. Um, so it's my uh, privilege then to give you a little bit of a primer on them today. If we can actually have the slides on, here. So Polaris runs the U.S. National Anti-Trafficking Hotline. You get 20,000 calls a year, and in a moment you're going to be looking at a heat map uh, of some of the cases that they've gotten uh, involving domestic work specifically. So these are people who are victims of force, fraud, coercion, uh, they may be gardeners, uh, they may be maids. Uh, can we please have these slides in the meetings? <coughs> <laughs> All right, well, shut your eyes and imagine. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, this is a, a map in Palantir, uh, which is, I'm sure, a company that many of you are familiar with. And Palantir very generously uh, donates pro bono their uh, tool and support to this project. Uh, every single dot on this map is a case of human trafficking in domestic work um, that Polaris has, has worked on. Uh, and it gives you a sense of the scope of some of the challenges. Now, we were very impressed with Polaris when we met with them because we realized that their data uh, has direct implications on policy. This is a, a heat map of uh, cases of J-1 visa summer workers who are in human trafficking situations. You can see on the time wheel on the right that this is summer months as we would expect for J-1 workers and it's all across the country. And Polaris took this data and worked with the U.S. Department of State to change the trainings so that if you're a J-1 visa worker in your home country, you get educated on what human trafficking is, you get educated on what the warning signs are, and you get the phone number of Polaris that you can call or text, or you can email them or go on their website if you find yourself in one of these situations. So the data informs policy, which changes the way that people interact with these services, which improves the data. It's a virtuous cycle. Uh, Polaris's data also reveals surprising trends in human trafficking. Have you guys ever been to a carnival, like one of those sort of modest, moving carnivals? Shout out where you've been to a carnival if you have. What state? What city? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania? Jersey? Hayward, California. California. So each of these dots is a case of a, of a carnival where there is a human trafficking situation. And each color is a different carnival. So all those yellow dots, the half dozen yellow dots, are a carnival that moved around 
the different states. And it could be that there were different cases of human trafficking, or it could be there was a single case that uh, cropped up in multiple sites. And when it's moving so often, when a carnival is ambulatory, you can imagine the challenge in mobilizing a response. Because right when you get a handle on it, the carnival's moved again, and you have to restart a lot of the, the work. Um, this gives you a sense right here of how Polaris does their work. These are, they basically mapped out 3,000 different responders across the United States, law enforcement groups, community groups, shelters, churches, and they map their capacity and their track records. So they can know in rural South Dakota, these are the folks to contact with this kind of human trafficking case, and these are the folks to contact with this other kind of human trafficking case. It's a very powerful model. Now, when we met Polaris, we learned that they get calls from 107 foreign countries. And this is a map of the non-US countries that call the US National Human Trafficking Hotline. It says a majority of countries on Earth calling the US National Hotline. And we were very surprised by that and tried to understand why that is. And what we learned is that Polaris is pretty exceptional in the way that they use data. And the support they get from volunteers, the support they get from the Salesforce Foundation, uh, the way that they use technology capture 150 variables for every case is quite unique. And so we worked with the Google Giving team to get them a $3 million global impact award to package up their model and scale it globally so that other hotlines in other countries can benefit from the same sophistication that they have developed. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of how we've used data in this particular case, uh, partnering with nonprofits. Um, but Patrick, I know that you've worked a lot with more qualitative data. You know, all the data I've talked about just now is quantitative. Moving to the qualitative side, any points that you'd like to share from your expertise? Sure, I, mean, I can tell you a story about one project I did. Um, I'll give you another statistic, uh, though you should bear in mind my caveat from earlier that you should take all these statistics with a, with a grain of salt. So according to the UN, um, the total revenue of criminal activity around the globe is actually three to four percent of global GDP. Uh, now, how reliable is that number? I don't know, but you can extrapolate from that that we're talking about a, a very large uh, uh, fuel of economic activity. And I had begun, begun to think a number of years ago about looking at some of these criminal organizations as businesses, because in fact they're generating a huge amount of revenue and they're run often in a pretty coherent, strategic manner. So I decided to, to do a kind of a, what I thought of as a Harvard Business School case study of a Mexican drug cartel. And I picked the Sinaloa drug cartel, which was the, the largest of the Mexican drug cartels. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with it because El Chapo Guzman, the, the CEO of the cartel, was actually captured a few weeks ago uh, to much fanfare. And I was thinking, well, how do you actually go about this? How do you find out how big the organization is, how diversified it is, where it operates, how many countries it's based in? Is it vertically integrated? Is it horizontally integrated? Uh, how much revenue does it have? How much market share does it have? And there really are no answers to these questions. It's not that they don't have books, because I, I discovered that the, the cartel actually has a fleet of accountants to go through their books, but they never disclose any of this stuff, and they certainly weren't going to give the information to me. So what I did was I started pulling case files from criminal cases in various jurisdictions across the United States. And because the tentacles of this one organization are so expansive, and they actually drill down into many, many cities across the US, I was able to go to these uh, local courts and federal courts in different states uh, and pull these case files, these criminal cases, and start getting dockets and indictments uh, and the transcripts of court testimony in which you actually had people from the cartel who flipped and ended up testifying in court. And what I was able to do by putting all of these out there is actually create a kind of a collage that allowed me to draw some conclusions about the larger shape of the organization and, and the kind of behavior that it, it engaged in. I can give you a bunch of examples, but one interesting factoid that I came out of this with was that, for instance, the, the cartel is constantly thinking about risk. Uh, what, they're, what they're really trying to do is move product from point A to point B and minimize their loss in doing so and their exposure in doing so. And there have been instances in which they actually buy insurance uh, on shipments of drugs going to the United States in order to do this. But there were a bunch of interesting uh, pieces that came out of that, and that ended up being a cover story in the, in the New York Times Magazine a couple of years ago. Having said that, this was a very arduous retail approach to research. It took me and an assistant almost six months of uh, pulling case files and writing letters to, to uh, cartel members in prison in order to come up with this. And a lot of it was actually uh, kind of rudimentary in terms of the techniques involved. What we were doing basically was pulling public records. We were pulling public case files 
that if you go to the courthouse and, and are willing to, to expend a shoe leather, anybody could get. And this got me thinking that it would be great if there was a way to actually harness these types of public records and make them searchable uh, for folks like me. And that actually is a, a good segue to another project that Justin and his colleagues have undertaken, the investigative dashboard, which I think you can tell us about. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been working for the last couple of years with some investigative journalists out of Eastern Europe called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, OCCRP, or as they occasionally put it, OCRAP. Uh, and they've worked a lot on tracing uh, shell company ownership. So they've done work to figure out uh, where Mubarak get his assets. They've done work on the Mininsky case, uh, you know, the, the Russian accountant who was killed in, in prison. Um, they've done work in Azerbaijan, tracing nepotism and corruption. And over and over again, they find themselves needing to look at shell company havens like Panama and try to understand who owns some of the companies that are registered there. So sort of pulling the thread back to the source. And so what we did in collaboration with them was to develop this tool investigative dashboard that makes it easier to conduct that kind of cross-border uh, investigation using public records. And I sort of think about it as a caption. So you're a very technical group of folks, so you'll appreciate sort of one way of conceptualizing it is that there's a small set of records that might be actually um, legally and technically able to get into OCCRP's platform directly. So you can sort of scrape them, you can aggregate them, and it's sort of like an L1 cache. It's the smallest number of records, but it's hopefully the most valuable. If you find what you're looking for right there, you're done, it's great. If you have a cache miss, then you fall back on L2 which is a set of additional databases that OCCRP has assembled. It's a few hundred different databases in different countries all around the world. For legal or technical reasons, they're not able to scrape them directly, but they can at least point you to them and say, okay, you didn't find what you wanted in L1, here's the places to look in L2. If there's an L2 miss, then you go to DIPS. And in this case, what that means is a research test. So we've been working with OCCRP to create a tool where there can be um, basically a sort of volunteer network of investigative researchers, as well as paid staff at OCCRP, who can handle incoming requests, whether it's from investigative journalists, nonprofits, uh, international organizations like the World Bank, um, that are trying to trace these transnational illicit ties. Um, and so our hope is that it's helpful for you, Patrick, and, and for others as well. Yeah, and I should say, for me, this is, in doing these types of stories, it's very often a, uh, a roadblock that I hit at a certain point. There was a guy who I, I quoted in the story I wrote for the New York last summer who, who described it as a web of corporate opacity. But, uh, <laughs> the problem is that you have, you have these complicated uh, um, accounts which are structured in, in various banking havens, and you often do find that you're, you're from an investigative point of view, uh, that the, the trail will, will run cold for me. I haven't played around a little bit on investigative dashboard and gotten to know the folks who put it together. I think it's a, a system that has tremendous promise. Um, I do wonder though, uh, Justin, if you could talk to us a little bit about what some of the challenges and the limitations to this kind of approach might be. I mean, it seems to me that um, it's often going to be the case that you'll find something that may work in an immediate context but is difficult to scale or difficult to, to look at uh, across borders or languages or jurisdictions. Um, there may be uh, an issue of access that in some of these cases talking about um, bubble technology or what have you, that the, the communities that are most at risk for some of these problems may not be communities where uh, these types of technologies have penetrated to a great degree. And I also wonder about trust, if you could talk to us a little bit about um, once you have these types of tools, uh, like with Polaris, uh, that are out there, how is it that in an environment in which you have vulnerable people who, who really don't have much trust, uh, you can get them to take advantage of, of what you're doing? That's a really good question. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I went down to Monterey, Mexico. This is a city with, I think, the same per capita GDP as Germany, close to it, and uh, quite a quite a severe violence challenge in the last few years. It's become a, a transshipment uh, waypoint for, for various drug networks, and they have turf battles. And, uh, literally, um, there was a shootout on the highway the day that I arrived, for example. Um, and uh, you know, there's a very innovative nonprofit that we met with there called the CIC, the Citizen Integration Center. Uh, and they're basically running a sort of public alerts broadcast system on Twitter. Uh, so you know, in, in Monterey, you can get tweets via SMS, and you can basically subscribe effectively to SMS alerts for your neighborhood when there are incidents of public security interest in your neighborhood. A uh, very powerful model, you know, very simple tools that they're using. Um, but in order for it to work, they need to actually get tips. 
They need to know what's happening. And the first year that they were operating, they got very few tips. Um, but one thing that stuck with me that the, the director told me is that the first year they were operating, they did get random people reaching out to them on Twitter with a pseudonym and just saying, good morning. And they would always reply, good morning to you too. And eventually some of those same accounts started to actually send them actionable tips about incidents that's happening in real time. And, and what they realized is that if somebody messaged you and says good morning, they're really saying, if I send a message to you, does it go into a black hole or is there a human being who's going to take this seriously? And when they learn that the answer is the latter, then they start to take that relationship seriously too, and they start to build trust. And so trust takes time, and trust takes hesitant steps forward and seeing a positive response and learning that this is an action that, that you can take going forward. You know, with Polaris, we saw the, the map of all the different states and all the different protocols that they have, you know, sometimes down to the, the sub-city uh, level of who are the right responders, the trusted responders. The respond and so whenever you're talking about scale, whenever you're talking about globalization, you're not just talking about changing the language of the interface. You're talking about getting enough of a, a response network in place that you can build that trust with the community over time. It just sounds like you're not, you're not in, in no way is this automating around the, the incredibly important sort of almost intimate human role that, that uh, is needed in order to address these problems. I mean, I think particularly on, on a local level, it's really about building a network. Yeah, I mean, our mission statement, as I mentioned, is to enable people to confront threats because the people still need to take that step. And you know, our, our hope is that our tools can be of use to them, but there's no substitute for human courage. Sure. Well, listen, we have a, a little bit of time left. If there are questions in the audience, and I think there are mics here. Um, and uh, this is uh, obviously a, an idea based based on input, and in that spirit, we very much like to hear input and questions from, from all of you. I think uh, you can also tweet them, and we'll hopefully be able to see them on the side screen. Yeah. See, this is an instance in which we need trust. We need you to feel that trust to come forward. And, uh, <laughs> where it's, I think you may want to go to one of the mics. Um, okay. Uh, Sally Lieber, I authored uh, California's Law on Human Trafficking, California Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and that law is now spread to many other states. Um, but increasingly, I'm seeing a role for local government, and I'm wondering uh, what activists who are in the community who want to be engaged in getting local government into the game uh, can do in terms of uh, data. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. I'm not an expert on local governance, but one thing that I will say is that I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's often an understanding gap in America in terms of how our own actions as consumers and business people uh, are part of global supply chains that impact trafficking, and congratulations on the act. I mean, that was a seminal moment in the anti-trafficking community. If I know that you were in the audience, I would have given it a shout out. Um, <laughs> But you know, there are tools like Slavery Footprint. I, I don't know if folks here are familiar. Actually, just a quick show of hands in the Have folks used Slavery Footprint? OK, so one or two. So if you go on Slavery Footprint online, uh, you can fill out a very simple questionnaire, and it will tell you how many slaves are working for you, roughly, based on some of the commodities that you have in your house, based on some of your dietary choices. You know, there are industries like the palm oil industry that have endemic human trafficking challenges. These are forced laborers uh, in, in very large numbers. And so I think as people in communities become aware of what some of the supply chain uh, risk factors are, you can see changes in procurement at the local level, either local government or local business, that can start to move things in the right direction. Other questions? No, no. Um, though again, I mean, I guess I would go back to this idea that the, and this, this certainly resonates with me as a reporter, that the, um, you're, incredibly limited in what you can do with an arm's length approach. At the end of the day, what you need to do is get to the most kind of micro-level understanding of the community in question and figure out who the players are and who trusted brokers that you can deal with are, um, which for me in trying to tell a story and figure out what's happening on the ground is really the only way to proceed. Uh, and it sounds as though with the types of stuff you, you guys are working on, it's a similar, similar deal. 
So hopefully that demonstrated that we don't bite, thereby encouraging a flood of questions. <laughs> Maybe our memory about trust is wrong. Exactly. Um, oh, there we go. Question. Uh, my name is Joel from BlackBerry. Um, you know, we heard from the McLaren folks that that gathering data and implementing you know, instrumentation is key for you know, building a model that with a better outcome. Um, you know, you talk a lot about a lot of problems where I think it sounds like collecting data is the problem. You know, what are your ideas? Where is where is that going? Are we looking at sensors of you know older generations of phones or other other touch points? Where do you see the data being collected from in a lot of these problems? Yeah, in the case of human trafficking, I've really become a very strong believer in hotlines because hotlines help people directly who are in really tough situations and also generate data points that can yield insights about trends. And so it's a way of gathering data that's humane that helps people, um, that has a positive feedback loop that builds trust. Uh, you know, there are other ideas that have been discussed in the community. You know, using uh, satellite imagery to try to identify brick kilns. Uh, is, is an idea that Kevin Bales has been uh, proposing. Uh, and there, there's a lot of merit in some of these ideas, but there's no substitute for somebody calling up a, a phone number, being walked through a series of questions by an expert who can really get the case, and then hand coding 150 variables that you know are, are rock solid. Um, I think that that's just really, really clean data that's hard to get otherwise. So, at some level you're talking about data for good and data for bad. And I think one of the greatest concerns I have is that with so much data available and with open source and free access, lower cost computing power, is are we looking at an explosion of just data for bad that will be really hard to combat? A quick clarification. What do you mean by data for bad? Evil, bad purposes versus we look at data as something that will actually help society at some level. We like to believe, I think, that that's what we're doing. And that there are many great examples of it. When you go to any of these shows, you see these wonderful examples of us helping with sustainability or food or all these other things. But the reality is, is with all this data, it, it can also be used pretty much for evil purposes as well. And so my question is in this battle, what, what do you see as the, the way to combat it? In 15 seconds. Yeah, well, one point I say very briefly is that, you know, Patrick mentioned earlier in this in the lower cartel that they have quite a robust data analytic capacity already. They're able to provide insurance, you know, on specific you know, cocaine shipments. You know, they, they're using quite a bit of number crunching. And so I think a lot of what we're trying to do is make sure that the public has access to some of the same data resources that the bad actors have. Thank you all. Thank you, Justin.